Hello and welcome to Quadriga. This week's summit between the European Union and the African Union was officially dedicated to the future of Africa's youth. But it's the troubling present that was largely in the spotlight. Catalyzing that focus once again, images of suffering and despair, like that of the would-be migrants from sub-Saharan Africa who land in detention camps in Libya, where they're mistreated, abused, even sold into slavery. Those images reinforce the pressure on European politicians to stem both the flow of migrants and their suffering. Pressure that has severely tested even the indomitable Angela Merkel. She sees a common interest on both sides, can Europe and Africa truly work together to give young Africans a future on their own continent? Are they not only neighbors, but truly equal partners? That's the question we want to pose today on Quadriga. And here are the guests who will answer it. It's a pleasure to welcome Christine Mundwa. She is a business journalist whose reporting focuses on Southern Africa. She says Africa is changing rapidly, but much of the way the West approaches the continent is still caught up in the old ways. And it's a pleasure to welcome Torsten Brenner. He's co-founder and director of the Global Public Policy Institute here in Berlin. He says, more development in African states will in the short and medium term likely increase migration flows to Europe. And finally, very glad to have Kifle Mariam Gerewold with us once again. He worked for 20 years in the field of development and now covers security and development policy as a freelance journalist. He says, African presidents are being misused as bouncers for the EU for the sake of keeping migrants out of Europe. They are ready to sell their heart and soul. Partnership becomes a permanent pain for Africa. Let me start out by asking you, Christine, whether you think a summit like the one that the AU and the EU have just held really can make a, an authentic difference. Can it bake, break through those old ways that you mentioned in your opening statement to really deliver a more equal, truly fundamental partnership for change? You know, Melinda, I, I'm skeptical. Uh, as much as uh, a lot of people my age uh, back on the continent, uh, we've talked about these summits and the fact that the average young person on the continent doesn't even know that such a summit is taking place. Um, if these people are meeting um, about young people, young people aren't even aware about that, just how much change can they really be hoping to bring uh, to young people without that, the engagement of the young people? By and large, as I say, Africans aren't even aware of these talk shops, so to say. Torsten Brenner, if I take a look at actually all three of those opening statements that I just read off, I'd have to conclude that the common thread in all of them is a sense that, if anything, European-African relations may take a turn, not for the better, but for the worse. I think that's up to all the decision makers uh, to decide that. Uh, I think we will, we're not headed for an equal partnership because European countries and African parties uh, countries are not equals. African countries are also vastly different. What, uh, what does Ghana presently have in common with uh, South Sudan, for example? But I think if we're respectful and if Europeans approach this, clearly explaining their interests vis-a-vis -vis Africa, much rather than talking about Africa as a basket case or a charity case, but much rather we have an interest in economic development, that's good for our business. We have an interest in migration control because we have problem at home with uh, right-wing populism. And uh, then you can approach this in a respectful way, but based on then arguing out your interests, and I think that would be a sound approach going forward. There was a lot of stress uh, amongst the European politicians meeting at the summit that they see common interests uh, on both sides. Would you agree with that? Where do you see truly common interests? Yeah. Well, that is, I think, um, the certain flair which uh, President Macron uh, always tries to show us. The, the common interests um, are that we are two continents that are historically bound together, that we have a very close relationship, whether we like it or not, that it is the, the continent that is in proximity to Europe. So, uh, and Europe needs a lot of um, agricultural, mineral and other uh, raw materials from, from Africa. There is no, no doubt about it. These uh, colonial business lines are there and will continue to be there. So I think the, the, the real clue is whether this head of states are in a position to transform this into uh, some sort of uh, partnership the methods they're using, the posture they're making, uh, 
the language they're using is not yeah. convincing. Yeah. Christine Mundwa, speaking of not convincing, uh, you come from Zimbabwe. Uh, your country has had an octogenarian, octogenarian uh, leader uh, until just recently uh, when Mr. Mugabe was removed from power. But you have a population with an immense youth bulge, like many African yeah. countries. Um, Europe, on the other hand, has a rapidly aging population and a very big demographic uh, problem. That seems like it could be the basis for a fruitful partnership. But uh, is it actually on the radar? Screen? It is, and, and I've spoken to a lot of young Africans who are aware of that. Young Zimbabweans, young South Africans, I reported much in Southern Africa, who are aware of what's going on in the, and the demographic that's um, taking place here in, in Europe, and aspire to, to get educated and come to Europe uh, to, to fill those gaps, so to say. Um, so yes, in many ways it looks, it, it is uh, a partnership can be reached there, but I think by and large what Africans uh, young Africans are appealing to is to say, see us as equal partners. We're tired of the sort of cosmetic rhetoric, oh, we're, we're here to help you. The reality is we can both give something. Uh, we've talked about the resources, for example, the skills that are on the African continent. You're talking about Zimbabwe, that's a very educated uh, co a country uh, with the highest literacy rate on the continent. So at some point, young Africans are demanding, uh, not just from the West, by the way, even from their leaders. Part of the reason why Robert Mugabe uh, fell out with a lot of young Zimbabweans was they looked at him as somebody who was old school in thinking. Robert Mugabe thought if you gave somebody land uh, and they could be a peasant farmer and they could, you know, be a subsistence farmer, for example, look after, grow potatoes and, and tomatoes and, and feed the family at night, that he has done his job. But young people said, no, we, we want to hold iPhones. We, uh, we want to drive a Mercedes Benz, for example. And so they're out of touch, by and large. So we're sitting with, with young people on the continent who feel that their leaders don't understand them, but who also feel like they're being talked down to by the Western world. Torsten Ben has something that often strikes me when I'm in Africa is an asymmetry of, you might call it, uh, information. Uh, we've just heard uh, Christine Wundwa telling us young Africans are very well, well aware of the demographics in Europe. But we in Europe tend to have a pretty one-dimensional view of Africa. When we talk about these negative images of Africa as a continent of hunger, of despair, uh, of migration, are we in the media partly responsible for the fact that this, uh, that the story is so perhaps one-dimensional? I think hunger and disaster always sells. Misery, you know, misery is what kind of drives, glues people to the screen. But I think uh, in the media you should have more interviews with entrepreneurs from Africa who are building up businesses, for example, or entrepreneurs from Europe uh, that are investing in Africa because that would kind of even out the picture a little bit. Of course there are basket cases and I, I, th I do think we need to do reporting on South Sudan, the horrible conditions there, or on the conditions in Libya because otherwise there's no pressure for change uh, on, on these. But at the same time, we also need to do reporting on industrial parks that are being built in Ghana. Uh, so I think uh, that will then help a more nuanced and informed view on Africa in, in the West, in Europe. Those negative images uh, that I mentioned were certainly very much on display in the run-up to the AU-EU summit after CNN broadcast footage of what appears to be a slavery auction in Libya. Libya has become the jumping-off point for desperate people seeking uh, to migrate to Europe, and that is putting pressure on European leaders. European pressures, uh, leaders, in turn, are pressuring their African counterparts parts to stop the migrants before they reach Libya. Let's take a look. A blurry photo is all David Bengua has left. His friend died of thirst when they tried to cross the Sahara to Libya. 90% of all refugees from West Africa risked their lives using this route through Niger. My friend who came in the same area in Sierra Leone died in my hand. So that was and not really easy. Now, David's in a detention camp in Niger, like tens of thousands of other refugees. Niger's government set up the camps under pressure and with support from the European Union. Mali, Chad, Mauritania, and Burkina Faso have also been called upon to keep the refugees in Africa and stop the gangs of traffickers, if necessary, by force of arms. Is this what a partnership between the EU and Africa should look like? Kifla Mariam Gebrevold, you said in your opening statement that Europe is misusing African leaders as bouncers. 
But don't European uh, politicians have a point when they say that both sides actually have an interest in ensuring that people who have essentially no chance of obtaining legal residence in Europe don't wind up as victims of Libya's lawness, lawlessness or dying at sea? Yeah, that is correct. But let's wind up. Uh, let, let's wind back. Uh, if you see the situation in Libya, the European Union signed an agreement with the Libyan government. Nobody knows which government they are talking about. There are three governments and at least one terrorist group operating in Libya. So how do you manage how, when you have an agreement with such in such a chaotic situation that leads directly to this kind of slave trade? This is appalling for us as Africans. Uh, we never thought that in the 21st century we would see on African soil uh, such, such kind of image. So as Abdullah Diop, the uh, foreign minister of uh, Mali, said it in the European Parliament a few years ago, they signed a deal with Libya without any plan and vision. And that's what uh, they have produced now directly or indirectly, slave, uh, slave auction markets in, in, in Africa. Yes, there is an interest also for the African side. Nobody in Africa is interested to see their sons and sisters and brothers uh, being uh, dying in the, in the, in the sea. Uh, certainly African leaders have got to do their part, which is to generate for the young people um, income generating activities that make it viable for Africans to remain back home. But nobody is taking them to task. Partnership starts with, uh, of course, this kind of, um, the, 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 this kinds of commitments on both sides. And um, sorry to say, but the whole issue of migration is basically because the 27 EU countries are not able to uh, agree and manage their own crisis. That is the starting point. Is I'd it? like to come in there if I could. Uh, you know, I, I also find it, you know, slightly ironic. You know, there's, there's this sort of selection process, if you will, sort of like a, we want certain Africans, but we don't want the rest. Um, you know, I know of young Africans who are sitting in very powerful positions uh, contributing to European and Western economies. Um, they've been taken out of the continent and they're improving economies here. Um, those people could have been very much useful at home. Mm -hmm. We cannot brain compete. Drain. Yeah, brain drain. We cannot compete in keeping those people. I mean, how do you take somebody who sat on President Obama's um, economic advisory panel? Mm -hmm. How do you bring that person back to Zimbabwe? Uh, you simply just don't have the incentive. So in many cases, if you're going to take the best people they're not going to be available back home to improve the conditions. And so everybody else is going to look to Europe as that place where the dreams are going to come true because the best of Africans are welcome to Europe and, and into the Western world. Uh, and what they do, unfortunately, doesn't have much benefit for the people that they leave back home. We can't compete with those incentives. Justin Benner. How do we fix what is clearly a very, very broken system? Uh, we're hearing uh, essentially here that the whole concept of the kind of immigration laws that German politicians now say Germany must adopt uh, would suck out even more talent from Africa and leave those with few prospects behind. I think, first of all, we need to fix the horrible situation that we have in Libya. And yesterday, Mr. Macron and Mrs. Merkel, together with some African leaders, outlined a plan to do that. Maybe it will work. It says the, the Libyan authorities, and I know it's sketchy, there are many governments and many militias operating, they give unfettered access to all international organizations and humanitarians to these camps. Then they determine who under the Geneva Convention has the, the a refugee status. Those will be flown out uh, to neighboring countries and eventually be resettled in Europe, uh, other African countries or other countries who are willing to accept them. And the rest will be returned to their countries of origin. But that, at least that clears the, the Libya situation. Longer term, I think you need to have a situation. I think Europe has a, a right to say, we want to control who comes to our shores. I mean, that's at least that's, uh, I think, a rightful approach on the, on the part of Europeans. So you need to open up uh, legal migration, uh, f both for refugees that are being directly resettled and also for workers coming. And uh, you're very right. This shouldn't lead to brain drain. That's why their ideas, they should be low-skilled, actually, uh, workers who, who come and being trained, partly also as, as circular migration, that they then can go back to African countries. So the ideas are there, whether it will work, whether those slated for circular immigration will actually want to go back later on. You cannot force them to, it's very hard to force individuals then to go back. But I think the ideas are on the table and uh, leaders are mindful of the fact that we shouldn't be encouraging 
brain drain reckless, recklessly, but uh, how it will work in the end, that's still fairly unclear. Let me come uh, back to one point that we saw in that short report just now, Kifta Mariam Gebrevold, namely the idea of other um, camps, detention areas, if you want to call them that, uh, centers, migration centers, whatever euphemism you use. The idea uh, has been something that President Macron of France strongly espouses. Uh, but is there any reason to believe that these other centers would work any better than the holding camps in Libya? Libya is particularly lawless, but is this aspect of the plan that Torsten uh, has just uh, outlined, do you think, really likely to function? Uh, I doubt it, <clears throat> but at least the situation would be somewhat better compared to Libya, because at least you would deal with one government a government that has also um, a track record like in Niger, uh, where you can um, find some kind of uh, uh, authority and it's not a failed state as such, even though they have their internal program, pro pro sorry, problems. And, and nevertheless, um, taking this kind of measures is what Europe is now doing is, is actually always trying to enforce through coercion. We have this uh, plan for Africa, we have Marshall Plan, we have Africa Initiative, we have Compact for Africa. It's a confusion. Even the bureaucrats in Berlin don't know who is talking about which plan. So it's a massive uh, scale. In a ma on a massive scale, they're trying to push something within a few years just to satisfy their own clientele in Europe. Don't we also, uh, Christine Wundra, have a certain uh, short-term, long-term discrepancy here? Europe perceives itself, at least, as having a very severe short-term political problem with migration and is seeking, also at this uh, summit that has just uh, been held, to address it in part with measures that take a long time yeah. to work, yeah. namely development aid and education. Yeah. And, and that's the media problem. Um, if you educate somebody, but the country does not have the, the correct infrastructure for them to build a business, for example, they're not going to be able to use that education on the continent. And you're quite right. Some of these plans really are going to take a long time. And people are looking at the immediate situation. I'm a young African sitting in Nigeria. I have no job prospects now. Uh, 10, 15 years from now, whether or not I'm going to be better educated than I am today, whether or not there's going to be a road to the city and I won't have to travel the long distances that I currently have to, doesn't make a difference. And I think when we see people risking their lives the way that they're doing, it speaks to the urgency of the situation. And these long-term solutions, unfortunately, just don't resonate. Let's take a closer look at this carrot that is being dangled by the European Union. Education and training for would-be migrants who say they are willing to stay at home. These refugees have been flown back to the Ivory Coast from camps in Libya. They've got the clothes on their backs and their lives. They're greeted by the lead singer of the hit band Magic System from Abidjan. It's good PR. We have to discourage young people from leaving and make them want to stay. We have to offer better living conditions here. Job training might be a good start. The youth minister visits some apprentice carpenters. He tells them the country needs young people. However, at the end of the tunnel, after this training, there is no follow-up guidance or support. We just don't finish what we've started. To become self-sufficient and give young people prospects for a future in Africa, the training center director says they need loans and investors, not handouts. Helping young Africans to help themselves, is that a solution? Kifla Mariam Gebrewald, uh, what do you think? Can such programs work even if the follow-up is spotty and the prospects uh, for truly uh, uh, good employment are pretty thin? Yeah. Well, I think generally um, I have never seen a country that has been developed through development aid. Uh, hence, it has to come from inside. Nevertheless, at least these kind of schemes guarantee it up to a certain extent that people can stay at home not only when they have um, income generating activities, but also a market outlet and a political system that allows them to flourish in their own system. And that is, I think, the key issue. Now we're talking about 40 billion uh, investment is uh, the European Union is planning. These are gigantic figures. Uh, most likely they're doing it uh, in the back head because the Chinese are already on the continent and rolling up. That is one other issue. Without conditions. Yes. Uh, 
And the second is, whatever one might say about the Chinese, I have my problems with them, but at least what uh, we can see with them is that they are talking on equal terms and that there are certain things that Africans can push through. Nevertheless, it does not allow the African states to simply uh, ne neglect their continent, cash the money, and then don't do anything. So good governance is a central issue, but good governance has to be claimed from both sides. Um, two aspects to that. Uh, first of all, the development uh, assistance piece. Uh, Christine Mundwa, I wrote my PhD quite a long time ago on development assistance projects that were essentially trying and failing to anticipate market needs and were uh, embedded in macroeconomic frameworks that were completely dysfunctional. That was quite a while ago. Would you say things are any better now? No, and I think, you know, a, a lot of people will tell you on the continent, oh, you know, we don't like the word aid. Um, you know, we're not sitting here with begging bowls, for example. But, you know, I'm sitting and I'm saying, if I'm getting a scholarship, for example, to study and it's coming through a development, that's not really my concern. Um, aid in itself, I think we've seen, is not working effectively the way it should be. But I, I want to talk about, put aid aside and, for instance, talk about the fact that are we having the conversation about what's happening when multinationals are evading taxes to the point that those amounts uh, far exceed what comes in via aid. Um, that's the money that's supposed to go into developing our continent. And then we then talk about aid and the fact that Europeans need to give us aid and we talk about 40 billion rand figures, uh, for, uh, dollar figures, for example. But in actual fact, we need to have a conversation about money that's being siphoned out of the country. And of course, we've got capital centres like London who facilitate tax havens uh, to help multinationals steal money that's supposed to develop the continent. So I think that's also a conversation worth having. Just briefly, if you would, because governance was mentioned, you come from Zimbabwe. Uh, certainly you've had uh, decades of experience with bad governance. Can Africa, can African civil society partner with Europe in a way that can truly effectively fight that kind of corruption and mismanagement? Briefly. <sighs> yes and no. Uh, yes and no. Yes and no. And I say that because when we talk about, you know, with our governments, I think we, we can safely say that a lot of our politicians are compromised in many ways. Uh, partnerships with, with civil uh, society has to be the way forward, is, uh, is how a lot of us see things. But the way that that is approached is crucial. So, Torsten, several uh, open issues there. First of all, international approaches to tax reform, to close exactly those kind of opportunities for money laundering that feed corruption, point number one. Point number two, areas where partnership could work on governance issues. Lots of lip services paid to governance. It's got a whole sustainable development goal of its own. But where do European and other development partners have real leverage to influence governance? I think I, I, I would say what Christine said like fair tax regimes, also making sure that African kleptocratic elites have a much harder time hiding the, their assets in Western financial systems. Fair trade deals, oftentimes the trade deals we currently have with African countries are not on advantageous terms for many of these countries and don't necessarily encourage uh, development. And then Good governance, yes, but also be aware of our limitations. We cannot force it upon rulers uh, there if they don't adopt it uh, themselves. But uh, whenever we do kind of resource investments and, and so on, that there's more transparency, that's f for sure. But I would go away a little bit from the development logic more to an investment logic. And that's what I think also these 40 billion you mentioned, that's the idea of the European Union. There's also the, there's many of these plans that, uh, for example, the Germans under the G20 presidency, they were all about encouraging investment uh, of Western companies in Africa. And if that's done on fair terms and if that uh, investment actually increases, I think there's more of a chance that that will actually aid development uh, later on than many of the development cooperation schemes that are currently being uh, rolled out. Kifta Mariam, uh, lots of lip service is also paid to uh, investment and the need to get the private sector involved. What holds investment back and where are there areas there for partnering perhaps to create a more effective investment climate? Yeah. I think first of all, too late, too little. Uh, they should have come investing in Africa many years ago, like other people in other countries have done. Meaning China. Uh, and India. 
Secondly, uh, it's good that a number of, Af very few, but some uh, African leaders and, and uh, business people have now started to invest into their continent. And uh, uh, for example, N Nigerian millionaires who are paying 100 million uh, US dollars for the next 10 years for African startups, and it has, it's working and is uh, uh, operational. And I think those kinds of uh, perspectives are good. Investment is better than uh, the aid. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for being with us, and thanks to you for tuning in. See you soon.